we will come to the next presentation. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Gazetas. Um, he was a professor of uh, geotechnical engineering at the National Technical University of Athens uh, for more than 30 years. And uh, his uh, research was uh, focused on uh, soil dynamics and soil structure interaction. Uh, I think we all know uh, the numerous uh, publications with uh, a high degree of practical application. And um, he got also uh, awards from uh, different um, uh, associations and uh, universities. And uh, today he will uh, introduce the topic uh, soil structure interaction, uh, which is uh, much more pronounced in the new code uh, in comparison to the old code. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, to leave the floor to Professor Gazetas. Thank you. Soil structure interaction is the topic. And I have to say from the very beginning, I have to say that this chapter is a very general subject. It's a very general uh, introduction or uh, uh, use of soil structure interaction. Other chapters that, that, that will follow deal with shallow foundation, piles, retaining walls, and underground structures, which we consider part of the soil structure interaction. So this chapter is only general rules. The old code did not have a specific chapter on soil structure interaction. But in essence, there are no fundamental differences from the old code other than there is a much more detailed description of how to perform soil structure interaction, what is needed for soil structure interaction. So the differences are not of fundamental ratio, nature, but rather into how we utilize, so to speak, the concepts. The chapter starts with the general requirements by stating that the analysis of CSSI effects should consider the two important components. One is the inertial effects, which modify the dynamic response of the structure by changing the fundamental period and dump. And I will explain in a second, in case you don't know it. And then there are the kinematic effects that modify the seismic excitation at the base of the structure compared to that of the free field and produce loading on foundation elements. Next, okay. So here is how the problem is posed. Uh, we have on the right, the free field motion, which has given us by the procedures of part one, the design spectrum applied at the ground surface. Now, the real problem is the seismic waves on the left, the seismic waves propagating upward, uh, imposing their motion to the foundation and then to the superstructure and the superstructure or the structure simply imposes its overturning moment and shear forces on the foundation. This is the interplay between foundation, soil and structure. All right. so. On the left, you can see what we mean by kinematic effects. Kinematic effects on an embedded foundation, slightly embedded foundation like this, mean that most probably the motion at the top, at the foundation base, the foundation input motion is not the same as the free field motion. The yellow represents the design spectrum from which we started. Uh, the turquoise is possibly the kinematic foundation input motion. Okay, now when the structure comes into play, we have the motion, the foundation input motion, but then we have an additional damping and the period of the structure has increased from an initial period, just a sketch, which uh, produced, for example, this spectral acceleration, the free field, you have a reduced in general, motion due both to kinematic effects, higher damping, and increased period of the system. So these are the two effects that we have to consider in our computations, no matter whether we have shallow foundations, abandoned foundations, and whatever else. When it comes to pile foundations, to uh, 
explain what is the meaning of additional distress, additional loading on the foundation from kinematic effects. If we have embedded, deeply embedded foundation and especially piled foundation, then even the kinematic propagation of waves will impose additional bending moments and shear forces on the piles, in addition to those that will be generated on the second part when the inertia loading comes and displaces the piles and Im imposes additional load. So this is the type of uh, two effects that have to be considered. The inertial effect, <clears throat> something that the old code also had, but now we made it a little bit more specific. When should we consider soil structure interaction effects? Now, the first one is obvious. When, by increasing the fundamental period, because of the deformation of the soil and the displacement of the foundation, increases the spectral acceleration. Obviously, this is a disadvantageous effect, the tremendous effect of the increasing period. But second also, since soil structure direction leads almost invariably to higher displacement, we have to take it into account when the building or the structure we're dealing with is in close proximity, if not in contact with another building and another structure. Then we have to get the displacement rather <clears throat> accurately accounting for soil structure direction. Now, there are two more categories. One is if we have really soft soils. If we have really soft soils, and by soft soils, we mean average shear wave velocity, within the pressure bulb, within the region of interest of the foundation, let's say three times the maximum foundation width, and so on, then we have to take it into account. We have to take soil structure interaction. Now, when geometric nonlinearity is effect for high or very tall <clears throat> structures, like towers, where P delta effects can be significant, soil structure interaction, because P delta effects depend on the formation, will have perhaps a detrimental effect and has to be taken into account. Now, the kinematic modification. Be careful, there is the word should be considered, not shall be considered. It's not obligatory. It's a, it's a very important thing showing. It's very important. You should do it, but you don't have to do it. Kinematic modification because it's unconservative it's, uh, to do it. So the code says should rather than shall. In case of deep foundations, now it's interesting. Deep foundations will affect the foundation input motion of the superstructure. Uh, all foundations are bended. And by bended, we just don't mean just uh, one floor and the walls uh, untouching the soil. We mean, at least two floors or equivalent and vertical surfaces in full contact with the surrounding ground. Then the abandonment does have an effect in reducing the foundation in proportion by itself. Now, with bridges and abutments, large abutments and integral bridges, which uh, don't have a separation between the deck and the supports, this is also in, important to do it to consider kinematic modification. You are allowed to use kinematic modification, essentially, as well as for very large foundations, 50 meters of length. Uh, I'm sorry, 50 meters length or width, whatever is larger. Uh, why? Why is this 50 meters? Why the large length? Because we envisage that the waves that are coming are not necessarily vertical to shake it uniformly at the same time, but rather they impose motions that can cancel each other and therefore the kinematic effect can be beneficial. So these are the cases that should consider kinematic interaction without being obligatory. All right, all seven, for flexible piles, modification can be neglected. Now, even the previous one could be neglected, but this says may be neglected for the free field motion Okay, and uh, what are flexible piles? These two are together, they should have been 
one, but it's two separate clauses, but it's a separate clause. A pile foundation is considered flexible when this ratio of pile Young's modulus to soil Young's modulus apply. Now, this has come out from this empirical, or no, sorry, numerical relationship, which I will explain in a second where this comes from and what it means. Uh, just to say the ninth one, that for vertical component, we do not consider uh, kinematic interaction. Now, if we, if we move to the next slide, here is what is the meaning of active length. I'm sure uh, geotechnical engineers know it very well. For laterally loaded piles, uh, only the upper part is really vibrating. The rest remains idle and the finite element based correlation that we find with the diameter and the ratio of the Young's moduli is the one that gives us the previous expression, what is flexible pi. Now, let's move, I don't need more of this. Now, these are general advice from there on and to how to do, how to perform the analysis. Uh, you may say that this is a sort of a, a, teaching in the class, but anyway, the code decided to have, we decided to have this material to help the engineer. Now, seismic action effects on structures shall be determined with a suitable model. Of course, it doesn't mean anything. Now, a suitable model can be a complete model with finite element uh, analysis of the complete structure, soil and foundation which is usually difficult to do. It's uh, computer intensive and time consuming. So the code says the ground reaction may be represented. Do you see my arrow or? No. The ground reaction may be represented with springs and dashboards for all degrees of freedom. And uh, of course there are six degrees of freedom in general three translational and three rotational with this specific indication. Uh, I will show you the example later on. Uh, coupling of horizontal and rotational springs are absolutely necessary for pile foundations. They're totally different answer with and without coupling between horizontal KH or KX. No, 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 it's all right. Okay. No, no, there's a, stay, stay there. <laughs> coupling of horizontal and rotational springs, as I say, coupling between the KX and the KRY. For shallow foundations, it's not important. It is very important for pile foundations and deeply bended foundations of caissons and so on. Now, for foundation shapes, piles, ground profiles, and so on. Eh, we can use elasticity-based solution at least in a preliminary stage of analysis. And as we'll see later on, to account in a, uh, in a simple way for nonlinearity and frequency dependence. Now, the annex is providing, uh, I'm sorry, okay, this here. Okay. Uh, Annex D is providing stiffness and damping for the foundations. It's a little bit more extensive. Uh, it's a little bit more involved than the previous uh, code in that we have the values for the stiffness. Again, this is finite element and analytical solution based. It's not empirical correlations. It's just simple fitting in the numerical data for the horizontal, Stiffnesses, KX, KY, the vertical, and the respective uh, rotations. And you can see here to the right the nomenclature for this, KY. Now, these are very simple expressions. It makes our life easier. You don't have to have winkler springs under the foundation to do dynamic analysis. You can just have concentrated springs. How you choose the G modulus is another question we'll talk about in a second or two. Uh, please, let's move. Uh, for damping, <clears throat> for the translation, translational modes, the damping is simply mass density of the soil, wave velocity times the area. The exception is, one more, the exception is the rotational modes. I only saw one of them, say RY, 
the dashboard constant, this is not damping ratio, is the dashboard that goes with the sp spring, okay? And this has uh, the moment of inertia of, uh, or the moment of area, JBY of uh, the foundation. And it has this coefficient CRY, which is a function of the frequency of excitation. And you can see that it starts from very low values uh, to reach the maximum. We'll talk about it in a while. Please, let's move to the next one. Now, the stiffness is unfortunately, in reality, as you know, are frequency dependent. So this is not an easy task. To do. So the coach tries to simplify things and says frequency independent stiffnesses may be assigned to each spring corresponding to what period now? Uh, to one period. There's no well, nothing else to do. The frequent the stiffnesses vary with period. We say let's use one stiffness at the fundamental mode period. Or in worst case, even if this is complicated, just use the static stiffnesses. It's not a big uh, deal to do it. The second problem with the formulas before or with the elastic stiffnesses is that reality is non-linear. So what do we do? Well, we can do an equivalent linear analysis where the G modules basically for the nonlinear springs should be compatible with the amplitude of displacements. And then in six, this amplitude of displacements may be obtained from the amplitude of from the amplitude of shear strains in the free field, meaning we perform a one-dimensional free field analysis. We get the compatible shear moduli, and these are the ones that we're using for the elastic stiffnesses. It's a gross simplification, but it will make the lives of engineers much nicer. They're allowed to do more complicated things, as we'll see in a while. Please, let's move. Now, in the force-based approach, <clears throat> now radiation damping, radiation damping stemming from the waves, propagating wave from the footing. Well, the, for, the, the charts that I showed you before for the damping, the C value, rho Vs, A, B, or the other curves, well, they are not good for everything. They are good as long as the periods we're interested in, unless there's a fundamental period of the soil deposit. All right? And this fundamental period of the soil deposit, if we go to the next one, we don't have to see more from here. Next figure. Now, if, for example, the natural frequency of the system is this, or the natural period inverse, Vs over 4H, for example, if the soil layer is a layer and not a homogeneous half space, then practically the damping ratio, of the damping due to uh, uh, sorry, due to radiation is vanishing, or it's become very very small below this value, and the and the damping curves are really chopped off below that period somewhat in what I only schematically saw here in this analysis. All right, let's uh, go one more step. Next slide, please. Okay, now the displacement-based approach, we start with nonlinear static analysis. Uh, this is in account of the fact that nonlinearity has a very substantial effect, uh, much more than the frequency dependence of springs at least, okay? So we require inelastic springs. All right, this doesn't say much, but if you do an analysis with elastic springs, it's easier than inelastic dynamic analysis. That's why we have this clause here. Now, when springs are not used, the lateral force displacement relation of the foundation can be calculated with the proper nonlinear finite element or finite difference analysis. This is allowed to do it, of course. This is becoming the state of practice and it's certainly beyond the state of the art in doing dynamic analysis 
with, uh, without really using springs or dashboards or simplified relationships. And the important thing is the last paragraph of this. Uh, I think this is, this is clearly new, the possibility of uplifting on the tension side of the foundation and slip badge may be included in the model. It is allowed to have significant uplifting and sliding of the foundation. The previous codes with, through various factors of uh, safety or material factors, uh, they essentially do not allow this. This we know it's not only, it's helpful rather than harmful to allow for uplifting and slippage and the code at least provides this. And I think this is an important aspect of this uh, chapter. And uh, let's go one more or two, we finished. Uh, yeah, of course, in time history analysis, you can use springs and dashboards. That's, don't say much from here. A frequency dependent, again, the same thing, frequency dependent stiffness for the period of the fundamental mode. Radiation damping is ended to the material damping in a well-known expression. Uh, and uh, the Annex D, as you saw, provides guidance for selecting the springs and dust spots. Now, if we can remove this. Now, now we have to take into account the fact that radiation damping from homogeneous half space solutions uh, grossly exaggerates the actual damping. In homogeneity, increasing of modules with depth, the presence of rock, as we saw earlier. And all these phenomena reduce very significantly the radiation damping, and we have to keep it into account. Now, the modeling of the kinematic effects, uh, well, it can do in one step analysis. You don't have to separate in the two parts, kinematic and inertial. You can have now with the finite element models uh, becoming essentially common practice, you can have the whole thing uh, in a separate analysis, in, without a separate analysis. Complete modeling, soil, foundation, and structure, for example, with finite elements. Of course, with piles, uh, suitable Winkler model should be used. It is used very frequently, where the pile is connected to the free field through springs. The free field is obtained, the response of the free field is obtained by one dimensional wave propagation, which is relatively easy. And then the springs are moved at their supports from this motion of the free field and imposes the motion on the pile. Uh, of course, in finite element analysis, we know how to impose the uh, motion at the base of the soil structure with proper uh, lateral boundaries. This is advice which uh, I'm sure People who are doing finite element analysis know it very well, but it's just uh, restated in the, in the code. If we move one more, and I think, oh yeah, I, I, I forgot that I explained this. Here is the usual way of doing a dynamic response, kinematic response of uh, a pile foundation. Uh, the pile springs and dashboards are connected not to a rigid vertical, uh, line or plane, but to the free field, which is moving one dimensionally, easy to compute, and imposes the motion to the pile. All right, let's finalize. Now, of course, these are simple advices. With Winkler modeling, of course, it's easy. It's as easy to discretize in horizontal layers, okay? And uh, the important thing is the no, alternative ways of doing uh, the pile kinematic effect, interaction effects. And uh, well, a simplified, the seventh is an interesting one to make things even simpler for the practicing engineer. The bedding moments, to find the bedding moments, the kinematic bedding moments of the pile. Ah, instead of time histories, you get the peak values and we impose them statically. It's slight, perhaps slightly conservative. And then how do we combine kinematic and inertial effects? No. The simplest way is B. We simply end up the two uh, bending moments, for example, or, or uh, deformations. 
but uh, we found out if uh, if the two um, uh, frequencies of interest, the frequency or the period of the inertial system and the period of the soil, which control the two aspects of the interaction, are quite different, then we do not have, in other words, if they do not occur at the same frequency band, then it's worth combining with the square root of the sum of the squares rather than simply ending, ending them up. It's a little less conservative to have this combination. And uh, finally, as I said, we can have simultaneously the two effects and don't worry about kinematic or inertia. Uh, the analysis should allow transmission of waves, of course, and this transmission of seismic waves, you know, important rules. We have to have non-reflecting boundaries, usually with dust spots at the perimeter. And we have to have small enough sizes, like for example, one sixth of the prevailing wavelength or one tenth for certain other aspects. Uh, and of course, the base acceleration histories should be compatible with the elastic response spectrum. Some of these rules are self evident, uh, but that's how it goes. And uh, I think, thank you. I know I took a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I saw several questions. Yeah, so no problem. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so before we will start with uh, further questions, I will uh, lead over to Alain. He would like to make a comment on the usage of uh, should, right? Yeah, George, you mentioned something which is, uh, okay, I will share my screen, it will be easier. Okay. Yeah, the meaning should, shall, may, can are, have a very precise meaning in your code. And should does not mean that you can ignore it. As you see here, it expresses a highly recommended choice of, or course of action. And uh, you are allowed to use alternative actions only when it is uh, subject to national regulation and uh, technically justified. Mm -hmm. you know? Because when you, you talk about uh, kinematic interaction, you say should, you can, uh, you may do it, but no. Should is a highly recommended choice. May is a co course of action which is permissible. So we have to be very careful with the meaning mm -hmm. of each word, shall, should, may, can, okay? Yes. Thank you, good. Okay. Uh, should, so it's highly recommended, yes. Exactly, yeah. yes. They discuss it a lot at the TC250 level, and uh, so it's important. Yeah, thanks for the comment. I think it is really important to, to read the code in the right way. Um, so the first question is uh, from uh, Kostas uh, Georgopoulos. Uh, he is asking the foundation should transmit the action received from the superstructure to the ground as uniformly as possible. And then there is a node in the code. This implies a sufficient stiffness of the foundation. Um, he's asking what, what is a sufficient stiffness? Uh, to remain practically well, to remain practically as rigid as possible. Yes, it's not. Uh, it's a qualitative term. It should not be a very flexible foundation. But I think it's more or less based on engineering judgment, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So you cannot put it in numbers. That's right. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Good. Uh, so the next question is uh, regarding the design of the stiffness of a pile. Does the torsional stiffness of the pile has to be taken into account? Yes, of course, if it's a pile group and uh, even the lateral response uh, can produce uh, torsion, let alone uh, when there are torsional vibrations because of the asymmetry of the building. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. It's not the most significant, it's not the most usual, but in general, you cannot uh, preclude it, of course. Okay. I think that's quite clear. So we have uh, two further questions. Um, I think I will give probably if it's possible, uh, but I can also try to... Uh, to read this question, it's a little bit longer. I will start with the last one. Which level of P delta effect is considered to be significant? 
Uh, new insights concerning pile groups. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Can you please? Yeah. No, I can answer the first question. Okay. The level of yes, of course. Of course. Uh, it, it's defined as a node in the in the in part five, and it's related to the the inter storage drift, and we define a value for bridges for building and so on. I I will not read the numerical values here, but it's defined. For example, if you take For bridges, if the level of uh, this parameter theta, which is related to the interstory drift, the value is uh, 0.1. But for building, it's uh, another value and so on, but it's defined. Okay, I hope this answers the question. Okay, so there is another uh, question from uh, Sebastian. He is asking, I have another question for supporting conditions of the structure, particularly links between piles of supporting walls. And there is uh, obviously a discussion in France um, that, uh, technic uh, that geotechnical engineers consider the head of the piles as embedded, but in reality, um, they have to consider the stiffness of the wall and the pile can't be totally embedded. So the engineer should consider, uh, is considering as a hinge. And the reality is between these two approaches. What is the right or better approach? So I hope I catch the <laughs> question in the right way. Well, it's a first, question. First of all, the code does not eliminate the judgment of the engineer as to how to properly model whatever. If he has a situation when the pile head is out of the, of the soil or uh, if the cup is embedded, he has to take it carefully into account. The code cannot get into this detail. I don't think we're doing anything in this direction. Uh, if, if I understood properly what he said. I will check the chat. It was not answering. No, it's perfect. So that was the other one. So far, no answer, but I think it, it was quite clear. Okay, thank you. Um, so there is one last question, uh, again, from uh, Kostas uh, Georgiopoulos. So measurements are all, uh, already available in the close uh, vicinity of, of the site, may be used provided documented evidence of limited variability of soil conditions. Note in such a case of limited variability of soil conditions, 100 meter can be regarded as close vicinity. Where is it coming from? So it's a question. I, I so did what, not understand. What is the I think he's asking for, for the basis of uh, the node in the code, right? What's now? Can, can, you, can you see the chat? Yes. No. Let me see. Or maybe he can explain his question. Yes. Can we give him the floor? Yes, of course. Please. Hi. Uh, hi, hi. Hi. hi, George. Sorry, sorry to bother you. I mean, uh, because I'm quite involved in the part one, I'm a sort of more structural engineer than geotechnical. <laughs> and now this is a note related to the geotechnical, uh, coming from the geotechnical engineers. Really, what it says is, uh, if you've got some site conditions which are uh, less than 100 meters from your site, then you can use them. And I was wondering where this 100 meters coming from? Is it advice from you guys, or is it just a structural engineer's approach? Uh, well, I, I don't collect. This is part one. Ah, oh, it's in part one. Yes, yes. Ah. But I, I'm just right. wondering because obviously yes. we have to talk to each other. And I'm just, yes, of course. I, I just want to make sure that everything comes along from part yeah. one, part one is sort of verified and accepted and approved by part five colleagues like you. Yeah. Uh, I don't recollect. I, I, How about Alain? Do you no, remember? I, I, I am not able to answer precisely, but maybe Kariazis has better information because he was uh, discussing this aspect of uh, 
viability across the site. I think and Andreas the... Andreas will say something, right? Yeah, he's yeah. looking. Andreas? Yeah, not on this. I have an. Ah, okay. an Okay. When we finish with this, I will be okay. happy. To... Okay. Yeah. Yes, do Let's you have wait a minute. On that? I think that the 100 meter. I don't remember if we put it, but anyway, uh, this kind of numbers uh, have to be put in order to have an order of of magnitude. Uh, of course, you cannot use it everywhere. In some places, maybe 50 meters should not be enough in order to take this. Uh, uh, close. So it's it's something just to help the engineers to know what to do, because sometimes in Greece, for example, they are using the same soil over over 1000 meters. <laughs> they are saying that we have the same soil conditions and we would like to avoid this. We say of the order of 100 meters in order to more or less force the people to start making more boreholes more geotechnical service. Otherwise, and you know, if a guy goes to 1,000 meters and take the permission, then another guy will take another 1,000 meters and it will be 2,000 meters from the first the point. And we would like to uh, somehow uh, stop this and we believe that 100 meters is something reasonable of the order of 100 meters. This is, this is the idea behind this, uh, this point. Yes, but uh, we have to be careful here because once we put a number there, the structural engineers are going to use it. And as I remember from the last yeah. year in Athens, we had a huge acceleration difference between up the hill on rock and the soft soil further down. So you could get a block of flats falling down uh, just a few meters from another uh, block of flats and stay still. So any, okay. any, adv any advice is going to be written in a way that mm. says, don't go ahead and use a number, if you know what I mean. We yeah. don't agree with this because all these issues are covered somehow in part one where we are discussing about soil conditions, etc., etc. We cannot come again and somehow ratify and, and change a little bit the way that we are estimated the soil conditions. If we have this kind of soils with very large and very pronounced uh, heterogeneity, if we have slopes, etc., then we are not speaking for uh, the same soil conditions. We are speaking of a different issue and we have to take into consideration both through the part one and other clauses as well. We cannot uh, have it. And and you know, from Greece and another Mediterranean countries, it is very easy to bypass a uh, few things. And uh, at the end, uh, I more or less developed uh, my idea. I hope. Uh, if, if I if I may just just complete uh, the the 100 meters uh, in the note is is related to a case of limited variability of soil conditions. So in the case that that you were. That you are mentioning, you you don't have uh, you you are not in this case, so you cannot use the one hundred meters distance for sure. Of course, yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thanks, thanks for the discussion. So, um, Andreas, just a short comment, and then we have to close this first part. Well, it's a, it's a short question, if I may. Uh, I think it it is of some importance. Um, the uh, part five uh, in the case of the displacement based approach encourages the use of uh, nonlinear analysis. For example, um, you have mentioned uh, pushover analysis and so on. Um, this type of analysis in the case of the, uh, if you like the superstructure of uh, the structural um, elements is well defined for concrete, for steel. We give uh, stiffnesses, we give uh, yield moments, we give even ultimate deformations and so on. My question is, uh, when we want to do no linear type of um, uh, analysis in, soil, in a soil in, uh, structure interaction context, we have to properly model the soil as well. Otherwise, what sort of uh, nonlinear analysis is mm -hmm. it? And apart from the 
table with a G over G zero, which in my humble opinion is simply not appropriate for this case. I mean, it is a free field. It does not take any account of the local deformations of the soil under the foundation. Basically it's the same G, whether you have a tall building or, or a, um, let's say a low rise building on top of your foundation. So what is the guidance given in the code for modeling soil in a nonlinear model uh, for SSI? Well, if I may say, it gives the idea that you use the suitable constitutive relation. I mean, this is not forbidden. It should be used. I mean, if you want to do detailed analysis, serious analysis of an important structure, you will not just go and get the G values and gamma and dumping values from the free field. You will get appropriate numerical models. I mean, we cannot exclude the possibility and we do not give uh, detailed information as to how to do, what models are appropriate. That's a very simple, uh, Andreas, you're right. Uh, with soil structure interaction, things are difficult uh, in the nonlinear uh, environment, especially at the dynamic. But uh, you do the appropriate modeling. And this is one of the clauses that says you can do a finite element or difference analysis using the appropriate constitutive relation. Yeah, what I'm what trying is? to say, is, uh, George, is that uh, the level of guidance is very different regarding the uh, superstructure and the soil. For the superstructure, we have detailed nonlinear loads, uh, stiffnesses, uh, strengths, and ultimate deformabilities for the members, but for the soil, yeah, you don't really have something. You, you, you are simply referred to the literature in the good old fashioned uh, way of a previous court, right? Uh, if I may say something about this, uh, it is. Uh, uh, may, so, maybe. Can I, we can are, I... we are, sorry, we are, we are running out of time. Okay. Um, so I think we have to keep the time frame somehow. Um, I think it is a fruitful discussion. I'm, I'm really sorry for that. Uh, but I think we should uh, try to keep it uh, because um, uh, we have a second part. Um, so therefore, um, we will see, maybe we have more time later on. We will answer the remaining question um, uh, via uh, the chat. And um, I would like to thank all uh, speakers of uh, the first session and uh, we will continue as scheduled, right, Rita? I don't know if you can, you can suggest Luigi just uh, to give some comments, final comments, and then we, we start. Uh uh immediately as planned but i think it will be interesting to have the final comments about this issue yes of course you mean my comment yes no my comment is that uh, <clears throat> in the end uh, i think that andreas uh, is right but uh, uh, this uh, reflects really uh, the common the practice in geotechnical engineering there are many many ways to account for soil non-linearity non uh, for static and seismic uh, analysis, and uh, these are not standardized by any means. Yeah. Th th there are a large number of constitutive models. These are becoming more and more used into the practice, uh, but uh, the, 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 the lack of standard in the real world is actually reflected in uh, the way of generic, if you like, yeah. uh, description that we give in the code. It, it cannot be different than this. And the last thing you want is to restrict people into how to do a sophisticated analysis. They have to have the freedom of doing it properly using current or advanced in the future uh, methods in the state of the art. You cannot really overly restrict them. It's already restricted enough, the code. Uh, that's uh, my opinion. Andreas, uh, just to add uh, a few things, in several parts of, uh, of part five and not only in, in part one, it is said clearly uh, that the selection of the parameters should be properly adjusted to the uh, strength. So uh, even for the uh, extra confinement that we have from the high rise buildings or what have been discussed uh, regarding the uh, constitutive laws, etc. All this is included in this little phrase saying suitable selection of the parameters in order to make your analysis. 
it is impossible to do otherwise. There are methods in order to estimate all this. The engineers should go there because otherwise we have to select something very specific, which probably is not representing uh, the uh, unanimous opinion about what is uh, the best constitutive law or uh, what, what is the best method to be used. So I believe that with this little phrase, everything is covered and left to the engineer to make his analysis according to the general rules. Okay, so Christoph was right. We have to be on time, 10 minutes break, right, Christoph? Right, yes. Okay, and we can continue discussing if you have time at the end of the webinar. Thank you.